Hi, this is Michael Bean. I'm a professional acting teacher and I run Biz Studio and I also teach my own classes. I've been teaching for about 20 years. This is your free lesson for myfreeactingclass.com for today, Monday, February the 21st. These lessons happen every Monday from 5 to 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, or you can catch us on YouTube. Where would you find that? I'm so glad you asked. All you would do is go to myfreeactingclass.com. Ta-da! I uh, would hit click here for today's lesson. And from here, you could also scroll to our video archive and uh, see a whole bunch of the videos from the last year, including a bunch by local casting directors or Vancouver, BC, Canada, local casting directors. And you could go to our YouTube channel, which would take you right here. And today we're gonna be reviewing several self tapes. If you're like, gosh, I wish I had the opportunity to share my self tapes and get some professional feedback. Well, you can uh, write down here, info at myfreeactingclass.com. You just click this link. It'll take you right to an email. You can send us an email with a copy of your self-tape. And then I'll, I would be happy to review those and give notes. Now, Natalia, who we're going to look at her tape today, I uh, meant to tell you last week, but she had very exciting news. She's been working hard on these self-tapes and you can go back and see them evolve over the course of the last year and a half and uh, she just finished working on a marvel series that was so top secret that she can't tell me the name or the name of her character and they didn't even give her a script until she got to set which is like that is a next level of top secret uh but uh, but that's really exciting because if you were to go back and listen to some of the dialogue that she and i had as recently as six seven months ago uh she was asking, here's how many auditions I've had this year. And it was you know, like, I can't remember, 15 or 20. She's like, is this normal? You know, what does this mean for me? And I just came back to, you're doing everything that you can. Uh, you just sort of keep putting it out there and, you know, like keep doing the work and stay focused on the process. And, you know, of course, you know, that doesn't, uh, there's never a guarantee of booking, but it's just so satisfying uh, to see her succeed. So, you know, big celebration for Natalia. Uh, Duke just asked in the chat, was she in the union? And I don't actually know the answer to that, but I assume uh, that Natalia is not in the union and I will ask her and report back next time. So uh, if for anybody who is listening, who's not super familiar, there are different actors unions in the United States, the Screen Actors Guild uh, in Canada. It is uh, ACTRA, the Association of Canadian and Television Radio Actors. Uh, or UBCP if you're in the province of British Columbia, which is the division of ACTRA, so it's a union of BC performers. It's the Actors Union. Technically, technically, projects are supposed to see union actors first. In practice, what happens is they can see whoever they want because there's just no way to enforce that. You know, because the casting casting can basically always say, well, we just weren't able to find what we wanted. You know, even though Duke's not in the union, he just had something so, so specific you know, that we had to see him. So very, very difficult to enforce those rules. You know, what, so a union production can hire uh, non-union or union actors. A non-union production cannot hire union actors. And so the way that unions typically incentivize being part of the union is that you have to pay a permit fee every time you work on a union project and those permit fees get more and more and more expensive as you get more of them you know so basically after you've got a certain number of credits it just makes sense to join the union you know and actors will often hold off on joining the union as long as possible if they're doing lots of commercials you know, some actors feel like being in the union makes them more marketable for film and tv I don't have a strong opinion about that one way or the other. I suggest you take your agent's advice. You know, in practical terms, casting directors for any kind of project can see union or uh, casting directors for any union project can see union or non-union actors, and they do. You know, once you are at a certain degree of professional work, basically you will end up having to join the union or else you will pay like enormous fees that don't make sense unless you're making a lot of money doing non-union commercials, and then it'll be a non-issue for you. So. That's the bare bones of that piece. Uh, today, I'm going to review two self-tapes. And then if we've got time, I'm going to look at a script. And the self-tapes are related to the thing that I want to talk about today, which is some specific technique around setting up your self-tapes, particularly audio and framing. So let's just do a quick review of framing. This is what is called a medium close-up. 
Uh, if I was to pull back uh, until you can see my waist, that would be a medium shot, right? So this is you, this is a medium shot, and uh, the so you can see down to about my waist. Okay. So medium close up. Now most auditions somewhere between that medium close up and a medium shot. You probably don't want to get any closer you know, than that. You, I have seen auditions taped like this. This is probably a little bit too too close just in that that's not what they're typically going to see on screen you know, and, and you want to just mimic what people are used to seeing on television so is a medium close up uh the eye line is the imaginary line between your eyes and what you're looking at right now i'm looking right at you because i a lot of people watch these on um uh, on youtube and I want to be able to look right into your eyeballs and say, hey, I'm a queen, I'm an acting teacher, la, 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 la. Here's the advice I'm looking right at you when you're watching at home. But for a film and TV audition, you would want to put the eye line just very close to camera. Boom, boom, but never directly at the camera because even a little flick over there is enough to break the illusion that the camera is watching you and you're in a private space. So that's eye line. One easy way to think about that, which I've been coming back to over and over again, is if you turn far enough that your nose starts to cut off this eyeball, you probably turned too far. You know, so, and I've got an extra large nose, so you know you probably have a little more movement than I do, but the uh, eye line needs to be close to camera, just one side or the other. If you have two different things or two different relationships in the scene, it can be very, very helpful to place them on opposite sides of the camera to make it really, really clear. Here is my emotional relationship with this person, and then even though it's not very far movement for the audience, it's super clear because the eyes go from this side of the screen to that side of the screen. So it's like this person I feel safe and comfortable with and that person, whoa, they're freaking me out. My eyes don't physically move a long way, but it's really, really clear for the audience. There's two different emotional relationships. And we're going to get into relationships later when I'm doing script analysis. But the story analysis tool that I've been using lately is really simple. It all fits on one hand. Story, style, relationships, change, want. Yeah, and it's just a way to kind of make it easy to hang on to what are some of the key decisions that need to get made here. And those relationships, especially for film TV, end up being very, very significant, very important in kind of holding the story down. Uh, audio, you want obviously the actor to be louder than the reader, the person who's doing the other side. You want a nice neutral background, which you can see for me here. You can even see in uh, Duke, who is at home. Hi, Duke. Uh, the And you'll see in the tapes that we've got today. So uh, here's the first tape. This is one that was submitted by Duke. He was like, is it okay that I'm sending so many tapes? And yes, of course, we, I want all the tapes. And I just want to celebrate the two actors whose tapes we're looking at today, that allowing yourself to do imperfect work and have it be witnessed is challenging. It's something that is really a barrier for a lot of people who are learning acting. They're like, they, they cannot tolerate the fact that it's not perfect. And that's when they stop. Comes back to that piece of advice from the Ira Glass on storytelling video, that the way past that point is just to create a huge volume of work. You just give yourself a reason to make work over and over again and share it. And so that's what our actors are doing today. More power to them. Now, let's take a look at Duke's video, so. So there's a light reflected in his eyes, eye light. The eye line is nice and close to camera. The background is neutral. Uh, the, this is, um, and I think possibly both of the tapes we're looking at today, one of my key pieces of feedback technically is that both of them are perhaps shot slightly too close. And with both of them particularly, the reader is so quiet, it is very difficult to hear what the reader is saying. And that makes it sound a lot like they are performing with a recording, you know, or uh, possibly even, you know, like performing by themselves if it's quiet enough. In both of these cases, I can't make out enough of the story. And because I don't have the script right here in front of me, I'm like, well, I can kind of get the idea from just what Duke's saying, but I can't hear the other person. And uh, this is actually feedback that I shared a few weeks ago that I got from my agent. Both of these things are on my mind because I got the feedback that I was uh, shooting my auditions sometimes too close, you know, here, uh, and uh, that I had the volume on my computer because usually I'm using a computer to read for the reader. Uh, I could have somebody on Zoom or on video on the computer and then I'm recording with the phone and I had my computer volume turned down so low that they could not hear the story. So throwing that out there that you'll see that with both of these tapes, but that's a significant issue, I think. Okay. 
right? So particularly because the reactions are so vivid there, you know, and there were all these like really interesting, vivid, clear choices about reaction. Because we couldn't hear what you were reacting to Duke, it did make you look um, like a little bit sort of spastic, twitchy. And, and maybe that was ultimately what you were going for. You know, but I think that had we, we been able to hear it, then they would have seemed motivated. And I suspect they were, uh, but listening to the tape, I can't make out what's on the other side. Gives you the right to tell me where to go. I live in this city. This is a community center. I have a right to be here. Go back to whatever else you're doing. I don't care. I'm not going. Who signs your paycheck? Bring them out to talk. So again, the, the reactions are clear, but I can't hear what the other person is saying. And with this much, wasn't listening, much of a conversation. business I get it I'll go somewhere where they respect people more than this place uh, okay so uh, the really interesting clear physical choices around telling the story here uh, there are a couple of these choices that to me read as theatrical you know or too much I think it's like a little bit too twitchy right now I think that um, and this has come up in tapes before, Duke. I think you're you're leaning into your accent in a way that, for me, sounds like you're playing a character as opposed to being yourself. And I think that if you listen to the difference, uh, folks who are just watching the tape between uh, Duke talking as the character and then Duke doing his slate, when he Duke's doing his slate, that's just Duke talking, and you can hear the difference in the resonance of the voice. You know, and and also I think of you know, the. Um, uh, hopefully you'll hear that uh, difference that I'm talking about. You know, the And the last time that I gave Duke this feedback, he's like, hey, I was trying to do a specific thing. I was trying to be drunk and they told me to. And so maybe there's another situation here that because I don't have the breakdown, I don't know exactly what's happening. That's entirely possible. But the way that it sounds to me is there's like character, like an actor deliberately playing a character as opposed to just a person who is you know, in an uncomfortable situation and like feeling very intense. You know, if you want to play somebody who's slightly unstable like this, one of the ways to do that is to pick emotional relationships that are disproportionate. So rather than like play some kind of, you know, crazy or unstable, what you want is this thing is so intensely important to me that other people are going to think it's, you know, crazy or irrational, right? But you want your in characters, I think, internal story to be pretty consistent, to be pretty solid. And so that's one way that I would approach this. Also, I think there may be a volume issue. I think that your microphone is picking you up really well. And so it sounds a little bit to me like you're projecting. And what happens when people project even a little bit, which can happen when just somebody gets excited, is that it flattens out what would normally be the ups and downs in their voice. And I think that this has come up with your tapes uh, a couple of times, Duke, that looking for those changes is one of the ways to bring your tapes more to life in a way that that might be genuinely helpful. Like looking for where those transitions are yeah, and then coming back to that foundation of in order to be professional film and TV ready, we have to believe it, right? So the foundation has to be believable before we put in those you know, big clear character choices. And so I would start by uh, the uh, really finding that clear foundation of like talking in my voice, uh, talking at a volume that's appropriate for somebody who's just like arm's length away from me. You're just like the end of your, the end of your arm, you put somebody else's face there. If you're talking louder than that, then probably it'll sound like this a little bit. And it's not hugely different, but if somebody's watching a hundred tapes then some of them are in this, like, I'm just talking and I trust the camera can hear me. I'm letting the camera come to me. And some of them have this extra energy of I'm giving this a little bit of extra energy because I'm just excited and I'm not noticing. Like you, it, the difference is very clear, you know, and, uh, and it, it just flattens out some of the, the depth and the detail. Now, I will also add this caveat, which I try and remember to add always, which is that 
we have seen multiple times over the course of the last almost two years of these free classes that sometimes I will give a detailed critique and somebody will be like, yeah, I booked it anyway. Uh, and so all I'm looking for is here are some things you can think about technically. Here are some things that might uh, improve the technical quality of the tape or the way that your acting is coming across. But the foundation is like, keep doing it. It's always going to be imperfect. You know, thank you so much for sharing. Yep, so there's our first tape today. Uh, ah, Duke said he got a shotgun mic. And so he's got a, now he's got a like way better, clear mic. And so it's just like hearing every little whisper. <laughs> and so now it sounds like he's shouting when he's talking at the volume that he got used to doing completely normally for uh, his uh, phone, probably. Yep. Technology, you know, we're sort of playing with the technology here. It's like when you adjust your lighting and suddenly you're like, wow, suddenly I'm so much prettier than I was before. Oh, right, it's just because my lighting is way better. Uh, let's look at Natalia's tape and you know, see if you can see some of those similarities. You know, see if you can kind of guess in your head some of the things that I'm going to uh, throw at Natalia's tape. I think we'll just watch the one of them. Please. Right, so uh, I know that Zoom, there's a certain amount of uh, loss of quality you know, when I'm screen sharing. And so, uh, but I can say that from my end, uh, I can't actually make out what her reader is saying. You know, and uh, you know, I, I suspect that that's an overcorrection, you know, or maybe she just taped it and just didn't think to listen it back, or do a test clip and listen back to it. Um, because there <clears throat> definitely have given Natalia feedback before. Oh, in this one, the reader was so loud, was too loud, was louder than you, was distracting. You know, and so uh, this, this I think is possibly an overcorrection in the, in the other direction because I can't make out the story, I can't make out the things that she's reacting to, which makes it makes it seem a little theatrical, even though it's not. Like she's reacting to something she's really hearing, but as an audience, I can't make it out. It is difficult to say at the moment because he didn't wake up yet. But usually in these cases, we experience such things as memory loss or other cognitive issues, for example, difficulties in speech or problems with movement and balance, like cerebral palsy, headaches, fatigue. Jesus Christ. Okay. Okay. Yes, certainly. I've had young patients who died because of men being infections. Also, septicitis can develop and they lose limbs. Look, Owen might have been very lucky, but we need to observe and see next few weeks, okay? So uh, the one of the things that Natalia was very concerned about, you know, she was very concerned about the technical dialogue and I, the the character as for a BBC show uh, that she asked us not to mention, uh, and uh, she was very concerned. The character was written with a Hungarian accent. You know, the I think I believe that Natalia's accent is actually. Uh, Russian? It's, uh, uh, the, you'll have to correct me if I'm uh, guessing wrong. I'm not sure that I've ever directly asked because we've seen her audition for like Russian, Ukrainian, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of Russian spies and things. Uh, and uh, at least in the world of film and TV, it's sort of close enough, you know, that uh, it, you know, even for a show you know, that is based out of Europe, you know, I think that she probably made the right choice by not by staying with her uh, the accent with which she's most familiar, so sort of speaking in her voice. I mean, this is a, you know how she talks. Uh, she was worried about the technical dialogue. So would all these strange technical words like trip up her tongue and make it more complicated? I think you can see that there's a little bit of thinking going on, but not very much, honestly. I, that to me. You know, is not a super significant thing. I think that uh, giving like a, a straight read, you know, when you get highly technical work, it's a decent choice. You know, you, you go in and like that's you're like, oh yeah, this is how doctors operate. She also found the beat at the end, which is like, okay, look, I told you all the scary things, but like we're just gonna have to wait. You know, and and so that shift is important. You know, so my main note here, uh, and I think uh, my hope is that you'll really notice this. If I just mute it. You know, and play it from the beginning. Let me see how I do that here. Oh, yes. Ta-da! 
is how much she's moving her head. You know, and I think that that's where that like extra, that's a, a combination of like the frame being just a little bit too close, which I have a hunch in this case, she just had a doorway you know, and the background would have been distracting. You know, the, uh, you know, so that, that might not be something she can correct, you know, but she's using her head to talk. Like she's sort of using her head and chin to indicate in a way uh, that to me is reading as actory. Right, it's, it's very uh, unusual. And if I sort of uh, come back and I'm, and I'm telling you something with every sentence, you know, I'm gesturing. It, it can be very tempting to do this when you're acting because you're like, it's just a bunch of dialogue. Oh my God, I can't just like deliver all these words. You know, but I think it's important to remember that, um, that, that that sort of embellishment is typically unnecessary. You know, and if that energy wants to go somewhere, and I think this would have been useful for both Duke's scene and Italia's, which is one of the reasons I wanted to show the two of them to you back to back, there are ways to find physical behavior. So if, you've, uh, uh, if you have a sense of place, if there's something going on, physical behavior is a great way to tell the story of like, I'm a patron and I'm just trying to listen to my music. Right. So in Duke's situation, you know, like he could have had a chair, we could have had him leaning back in a chair, we could throw his arm up over, we could have actually, you know, he could have actually brought in his headphones, you know, and like had the music and had the moment with the music, you know, so that he's got to, you know, do this and the obviously not going to be playing the music probably. Um, because then the risk is they start listening to music and they're like, ACDC, that's oh, like, they have their feels about it. Don't distract them you know, with that, but like using a real, you know, uh, real headphones for this, because I'm sure that you know, Duke's just got them around, would help tell the story. I like a little bit of uh, some small prop to help anchor the scene. If you've got red sparkly shoes, you probably don't want to bring them in and wave them around, even if you're mentioning the red sparkly shoes, but something like a water bottle, a cup, a uh, a pen, a coat, a jacket, a bag that you stuff things into. I've seen these things really bring a scene to life because it brings us from like, I'm watching an actor who's just doing a scene into I'm watching a real person who's in a place doing a thing, right? And so the little bit of physical behavior might have helped tell that story. You know, when I was like, fine, okay, I'm just gonna take the headphones out, and, you know, pull this coat around him or like grab the, this stuff off the table. And even if that's not real stuff, as long as it's down, it can be mine even as long as it's down here, but like since you're taping at home, why not use a real thing? Certainly for me as an actor, touching a real thing always grounds me. And the same thing for Natalia, right? So that energy that's sort of going here, you know, in her acting, uh, we were, and it's just her not thinking about it and really trying like to reach the other person. I've done it. You will probably do it. You probably have done it before in tapes and haven't noticed. It's really uh, highlighting it here. Hopefully, it just brings it to your attention. One of the things that could work there is to have a clipboard, clipboard and a pen. You know, for for a doctor, right? You uh, finish the piece of business you're doing before. Okay, I'm checking the chart, I flip the paper. Maybe the audience sees it. Maybe they don't. You know, uh, but then like I'm busy. I'm in a hospital. I'm doing a thing. Right. So I've got to give you this information. I've got to give you this information. I'm going to reference the chart at some point. You know, like at some point, maybe I'm going to like sort of look over here at the hallway. I'm going to look at the monitor. I'm going to look at him and reference something specific. Okay. So, you know, like cerebral hematoma, blah, 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 blah. I'm going to look at the brain thing that's over here. It doesn't exactly matter what it is as long as you're making clear, concrete choices about it and you're not just sort of generally doing it. Right. The problem with mime is that typically it results in, in general behavior. So if I've got a pretend chart in my hand and a pretend pen in my hand, then writing on the pretend chart usually just looks like this, where I'm not writing real words or anything. You know, and, and typically that doesn't bring the scene to life in the same way as like, look, just flip to the second page and sign your name three times while doing the little piece of the dialogue. You have know, something like that that's like simple enough that doesn't require a lot of thought, you know, but does ground you in real physical behavior, can give the sense of like, oh, this is a busy professional who's at her workplace doing a thing. And I think that that might have given that energy a place to go. So my hope is Natalia watching this back is like, oh, there's something interesting to play with the next time I get one of these highly technical scenes. Also, because doctors often have clipboards, if you're worried about that technical dialogue and you've literally got it directly in front of you, then uh, I'm not a fan of you know, obviously reading everything off of the chart, but if you need to reference it and you're like, the um, six technical words that I just glanced at to refresh my memory because you know I don't need to memorize all this stuff because you know, I'm a doctor and I have my clipboard and I'm checking it and not checking and after checking my line, I'm just a doctor doing my busy work here. Uh, can be a great way to cheat that. So hopefully that's some useful. 
so th those are our two tapes for today. And just you know, to uh, give you like a piece of context, pulled up a little doctor role so that I can quickly go over the story, style, relationship, change, want. And uh, as an extra bonus, this is a scene that I sent to Duke earlier that I encourage him to do for practice. You know, so uh, you saw Duke and you can be like, oh yeah, actually I would love to see Duke and uh, do this character. Uh, here it is. So uh, starting by looking at the story questions, Right, so uh, the story, who, what, where, when, why, how, these all the different things that we ask about story, but basically have you asked yourself, what is the story? Who am I? What happens before what the writer gave me? What happens after what the writer gave me? Uh, what is the story from my perspective? So not the like omniscient audience, third person perspective, but what is the story from my character's perspective? Right, obviously if uh, Duke is playing the patron you know, who everybody's annoyed with. He doesn't think he's annoying. You know, he thinks he's being unfairly treated. You know, the, and so that's an important adjustment to make. If you're going into the story and trying to pretend that it's real, then you're going in and really telling the story like I'm being unfairly treated and totally committing to that. Even if the third person perspective is actually my job in this script is to be like super annoying and obnoxious so I can show like what kind of terrible uh, working conditions these people in this community center have. Maybe that's your job, you know, functionally in serving the story, you know, but making that distinction of like, that's not what you, you know, are doing when you're playing that character. You're going in and telling the story of like, here's what unfair treatment looks like. God, um, style, episodic pilot feature, et cetera. It doesn't really matter uh, exactly what choices you make. I think as long as you get some sense of the style, you look up it up on YouTube, you watch a little clip, you're like, okay, here's the last thing the director did. If it's a, something brand new that you don't have reference for, look at the director. Usually the last couple of things they did, a couple of minutes of searching on IMDB and YouTube, you get a sense of the style. Relationships or strong feelings about opinions or people. Uh, uh, strong feelings, opinions about people, objects, and events, right? So it's just you're going through, like, what are the key relationships here? The strong relationship with eh, and this and this, you know, and then there's lots of different ways you can anchor those strong feelings or opinions. How it changes, that's the arc or beats, just it's a good story, it's got to change, it has to change, or it's not a, the best story you can tell. Uh, and then what do you character want the most? You know, uh, often called objective by acting teachers. You know, what are you trying to get the other person to do or feel so that you get your objective, so that you get what you want? It's like, uh, in this case, let's look at this short doctor script and you can make your best guesses on that one. So uh, this is from a show called uh, Resident Alien. Uh, the uh, interior Braddock Hospital. This uh, int, uh, INT is interior, uh, X, EXT is exterior. Uh, the uh, Braddock Hospital morning, uh, the light shines in the camera lens. This is a doctor's pen light. You've suffered fairly significant head trauma. Are you experiencing any issues with your memory? Light goes out. Harry now sits in a medical gown on the hospital bed. Dr. Bishop 40 stands next to Harry, checking him out. You were pretty dazed when they brought you in. They said you were found walking down the road naked. Do you remember anything? No answer from Harry. Do you know who you are? Beat Harry breaks the silence. Yes, I am an alien and I am here to kill everybody. The doctor reacts, end. Right, so story. I'm a doctor, I'm examining a patient who had a head trauma. Uh, the, uh, or at least a, right, a fairly significant head trauma, right? So I've seen the head wound and possibly I'm like dealing with it right this moment. You know, uh, so doctor examining a patient, you know, uh, who has been found in distress and has suffered head trauma. Uh, the style, you know, this, partic this particular show is a comedy. You want to go and watch clips of it. Relationships, the strong relationships in this you know, fairly short, pretty typical scene if you're auditioning for doctor characters. You know, there is a second scene, but today we're just going to look at this one page. You know, this strong relationship is with Harry. Maybe you also have a strong feeling or opinion about the head wound, just so that you, you're bringing a little bit of depth into it. You know, maybe you have a strong feeling or opinion about the hospital that you're in, but like significantly, and if you were just only going to make one of those choices about the person who's across from you. And this is where you have some flexibility because the script doesn't tell you how you feel about Harry. You know, so you could say, for my strong feeling or, or uh, opinion about Harry is that like, I am, um, the like deeply concerned, you know, that, you know, uh, or you could say I, because, you know, head trauma is very, very serious, you know, and I'm concerned that his brain scrambled. Okay. 
strong feeling of opinion. You know, so that when he's like, I'm an alien, I'm here to kill everybody, you're like, whoa, oh my God, it's way more serious than I thought. I was right to be concerned. Um, you, know, you could say like, okay, I am, my strong feeling or opinion you know, is that I have to maintain like, ab like professional detachment you know, so that then there's obstacle, right? Like what you want objective usually has something that stops you from getting it. And that tension is what makes stories interesting to watch. So when he says, I'm an alien, I'm here to kill everybody, you lose your, this reaction written in here. It's a comedy. Reactions are really important in comedy. So what is that reaction? Well, that's the choice that you, the actor, have to bring to it. Maybe you lose your professional detachment. Doesn't mean that you're, that's what you're trying to do. What you're trying to do is like, I'm going to, my objective is to be like, you know, rational and you know, competent and detached. And then he reacts and you're like, uh, he says this crazy thing. And you're like, <laughs> you know, and you've got to <clears throat> pull it back together. Or you're like, whoa, is he going to be dangerous? Are we going to have to deal with this? Like, hey, bring an orderly over here. You know, lots of options there. You know, uh, in terms of physical behavior, you've got the like light shining in the camera lens. You wouldn't probably want to shine it right into the camera. You know, but you definitely could like have a pen that you uh, used if you didn't want to. You know, like I like holding a real thing because mine where the camera can see it. Oh, I have a light in my hand, but I don't actually. It usually doesn't work for us. Right, so we go into key relationships, the changes, you know, obviously there's a big change here. And in this case, the change is marked with the word beat, which sometimes writers will do. So this, so the, right, so there's a beat here. Do you know who you are? A beat, a beat, the doctor reacts, right? So those, the big changes you know, are written right in there. And what does my character want? You know, which kind of ultimately ties back into the relationships. So you can see how those choices are nested. You know, and so hopefully that helps you understand a little bit more about what I was talking about in terms of story, style, relationships, changes, want, uh, when you are looking at the way that I reviewed Duke's tape and Natalia's. Uh, the, finally, uh, there was a question before we started recording, you know, which was like, for a Zoom audition, what happens if you're working with folks who just ask you to try it a little differently? And this happens uh, a lot in the context of student films. Um, Duke shared that he auditioned for some student films lately where they've clearly taken a directing class, you know, where the directing class, they've said, you just have to ask them to try it a little differently. They literally didn't know what they wanted. They're just like, now try it differently. Back when I was auditioning regularly for student films, I had people ask for completely crazy things that made no sense in the scene. They were like, now do it again, like you're a drunk priest. And I was like, uh, okay, but like I'm the character's dad. So uh, you clearly are just acting out. So I feel like I don't know what you're doing, except you know something that you know makes absolutely no sense to me. So uh, the yes is possible that you will be asked to do something crazy. Uh, very unlikely in a professional audition. You know, and I uh, I think that knowing what I know now, if I was asked to do, do it again as a drunk priest, I might say. Could I try it like this for you instead? And you know, if they say no, great. Well, maybe they really needed a drunk priest in some way that I don't understand. And then I've got to do the professional actor thing of like, okay, I will like give me a minute because I'm gonna have to figure that out. Right now it doesn't make sense to me. I'm gonna have to take a minute and figure out how it makes sense so that I can come into it you know, feeling honest. Um, now, barring that, and this is for real auditions as well, this is a piece of advice I got from a casting director named Edward Ray, uh, who I was sharing studio space with at the time. It's a little cynical, but I think it is useful. Uh, he said, always prep the scene in two different ways. So, right, so for instance, in the doctor scene I just showed you, you know, where one strong feeling or opinion you know, is, uh, I'm very concerned about you. you know, and the other strong feeling or opinion is like, I'm a, trying to retain professional detachment. You know, uh, you could also choose a strong feeling or opinion, you're like, I'm your friend, I'm your friend, I'm your friend. You know, so, right, so we pick two of those. You know, and uh, like maybe we pick two that are very, very different from each other. So one of them is like really warm, friendly, country doctor, like I'm gonna be super warm and open to you until you tell me that you're here, here to kill everybody. And then I'm gonna take in that change. And the other one is like professional detachment, professional detachment, professional detachment, holy crap, you know, big reaction. Very different takes on it. Both make sense to me. They fit with the rest of my understanding of the story. I go in with both of those. Now I pick the one that I think, you know, is, the best for the story and best for me personally. But then, and this was Edward's advice. Edward was like, look, directors don't really know what they want. They just want to know that you can make it different. So no matter what they tell you, just give them your second option. You know, because then what happens is they're like, wow, that was really different. It wasn't quite what I was looking for, but that's probably on me. Maybe I didn't express it right, you know, but at least it was really different. And that's what they were ultimately looking for. So his opinion was that if it's just really different, you win. 
Uh, and so that's one way to anchor yourself against like being asked to do something wildly unexpected is just have two different versions that work for you. And if you get something in, in the context of student film, I'm not suggesting you ignore the director, I'm not suggesting that, but in the context of working with somebody who's like a brand new director who literally doesn't know what they're doing, is like, I don't know, I'll try it like you're a fairy. You know, then you just give them your second take, you know, and then uh, the if they want to say like, huh, that wasn't quite what I was looking for, but that was really alive and real and interesting, uh, and then you can have that conversation afterwards. So that that is an option going in. And actually, I, I have chosen to do that sometimes for auditions, especially where uh, I was interacting with the real person where I was in the room or uh, absolutely carries over to Zoom, where if you have those two options and they say, great, God, that was great. Now just let's give them something a little different, which I've had happen in professional auditions. Having that second take ready has really saved my ass a couple of times. You know, and, uh, you know, and sometimes you can even go in and say, you know, I've got these two different takes, you know, the, like this one and that one, uh, you know, the, I'm going to lead with this one. Let me know if you want the other one. Sometimes, uh, in a, at least in an in-person audition, uh, that's given me the opportunity to, I think, do a second take and a different take, even when they would have just said, let's say, like, great, yeah, we like the first one. You know, like, you're done. If so, uh, can be a useful thing to prep and, to, and take into your auditions. So thank you for the question. It always inspires things that I might not have thought to talk about otherwise. Uh, come back here. Mondays from uh, 5 to 6 p.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time. I'm Michael Bean, and this was your free lesson for my freeactingclass.com. Thank you.